And welcome back to my channel. This is episode number six of the globalization kind of revision series over here on my channel. If you haven't watched the rest of them, I'll leave the playlist linked up here for you, or at least try and remember to. Um, today we're going to be looking at the global shift, winners and losers of that. This is episode number six, as I've said, so we're about halfway through. And then if you are watching and do study geography, please let me know in the comments what topic you'd like me to do next. I'm debating between coasts or regeneration at the moment um but yeah let me know which topic you'd like me to cover in the in the comments below i've already done tectonic processes and hazards and glaciation so they're both already fully up on my channel um just go into the playlist and you'll find the full playlist of that there um but yeah i'm gonna carry on with this this is episode number six i upload these every single week monday at 4 30 pm so please do subscribe down below i'm going to be going through the whole specification of the edxl one and i'm guessing that overlaps with a lot of others as well but yeah i hope you enjoy i hope you get something from it and then come exam season next year i'm gonna do like a 40 minute video just on each topic so like the full globalization overview um because that's what you do at degree so i've done essentially the a-level topic in an hour-long lecture <laughs> so i wanted to give it to you as well but that's not till next year because you don't need it until next year's exams um i don't think anyway if you need it sooner let me know and i'll try and get that filmed for you but right now i'm just going to go through the global shift winners and losers so as i said subscribe down below give this a like and let's just get straight on to it silk cotton and spices long before europe's industrial age ancient ancient trade routes known as the Silk Road brought valuable silk over to Europe from China and its sea routes brought extensive spices, tea and textiles with cotton being its like main one from India and Southeast Asia. However, in the 19th century, Europe's indust industrialization and the development of mechanized production techniques shifted a lot of textile production to Europe and North America and Asia's significance as a textile producer rather than just a provider of raw materials declined. Then in the late 20th century production began to shift again when cheaper labour in Asia, faster shipping times provided an incentive to relocate a lot of textile production back to Asia as well as the production of many other goods such as electronic items. The shift began in the 1970s and 1980s that is the movement of manufacturing from Europe and the USA to many Asian countries. This shift led to the economic re-emergence of the Asian region. The Pacific Rim countries such as Japan, Hong Kong and South Korea, closely followed by China and India, became major players in the globalised economy. By 2013, the value of two-way trade between the Americas and Asia nearly doubled that between um, the Americas and Europe. Three factors helped to accentuate this global shift. Individual Asian countries such as India began to allow overseas companies to access their markets with a new open door policy. TNCs began to seek new areas for manufacturing such as China and for outsourcing services such as call centres and software development in India. FDI began to flow into re-emerging Asian economies. This picture shows the FDI into different global regions. Notice that the flow of FDI to China and India did not begin immediately. Although restrictions on receiving FDI were relaxed in 1978 and 1991 respectively, the flow did not increase for another 15, 10 to 15 years. Similarly, it was over a decade after the collapse of communism before FDI in Eastern Europe took off, after many former communist eastern countries joined the eu in 2004. fdi in china and southeast asian countries has focused mainly on manufacturing however india's close political links with the uk together with with its adoption of english as its business and second language and its good technical universities has given it an edge in software development as well as providing call centers and other support services 
At the same time, faster electronic communication and shipping, trade liberalisation and the HIPC initiative have helped low-income countries to develop. The global shift, let's talk about China. The global shift into China has mainly has mostly focused on manufacturing. China has been the world's largest recipient of FDI since 2000, and its share of global trade by value rose from 3% in 2001 to 10% in 2013. The rapid industrialization of China has also been accompanied by rapid urbanization, particularly in the large cities near the coasts. By 2015, China had 150 cities, with populations of over 1 million, up from 30 cities in 2000. However, such rapid growth has brought costs and benefits. Ignore the cockerel, please. I'm so sorry. The benefit of growth. Investment in infrastructure. There has been an impressive expansion of Chinese in infrastructure. By 2016, China had developed the world's longest highway network. Its rail system had reached 100,000 kilometres in length, linking all cities and provinces. Its high-speed rail system, HSR system, was the world's longest, having doubled length in 10 years, with high-speed lines linking Beijing and Guangxi Guangzhou and Shenzhen, as well as with Shanghai. I really apologise for my pronunciation. Shanghai's maglev, a magnetic levitation train, had become the world's largest commercial train service. The 30 km journey between Shanghai's airport and the CBD takes just 8 minutes, reaching 431 km an hour. That's 268 miles an hour, which is ridiculously fast. It's because of the lack of friction because it's a levitating train. The second thing is reductions in poverty. Over 300 million Chinese people are now considered to be middle class nearly as many as the entire population of the USA. By 2022, next year, an estimated of 45% of the Chinese population will be classed as urban middle class. Sales of consumer items have also rocketed, such as the Chinese bought more TVs and laptops than Americans in 2013, which is crazy. Poverty in China has significantly reduced. Between 1981 and 2010, China reduced the number of people living in poverty by 680 million. It has also reduced extreme poverty rate, those earning less than $1 a day or less, from 84% in 1980 to just 10% in 2016. Although 20% of the Chinese population still, love it, still live on less than $2 a day, particularly in rural areas. Many cope with low incomes because of payments sent home by urban family members, known as remittance payments. Increases in urban incomes. Urban incomes in China have increased sharply since 2000, driven both by economic growth and slower population growth. As a result of China's now relaxed one-child policy, employers have had to pay higher wages to recruit staff. Urban incomes have risen by 10% a year since 2005, and by 2014, they averaged at 9,000 US dollars a year. Although there are still variations in average incomes between different urban industries, they are still much higher than workers would receive if they had remained in the countryside. Plus, their terms and conditions include a 40 hour week with higher overtime rates as well as paid holidays. There is a big and growing rural urban divide in China. In 2013, per capita net income after taxes and rent, known as disposable income, for the poorest 20% of rural households was equivalent to £412, compared with over £9,000 for the, 20, the richest 20% in cities. Better education and training. Education is free and compulsory in China between the ages of 6 and 15. 94% of Chinese over the age of 15 are now literate, compared to just 20% in 1950. In 2014, 7.2 million Chinese graduated from university, 15 times higher than in 2000. This growth in higher education has helped to create a skilled workforce for the Chinese economy's expanding knowledge and service sectors. However, again, there is a big rural-urban divide, with per capita spending on, on secondary education 
widely varying from £2,200 in Beijing to just £300 in Guizhou. The cost of growth, however, loss of productive farmland. Despite increased food production, China's industrialization has led to an increase in loss of farmland since 2000. Over 3 million hectares of arable land the size of Belgium has been polluted with heavy metals. 12 million tonnes of grain were polluted in 2014. The increased use of fertilisers and pesticides has also led to farmland near rivers used for drinking water being taken out of action. 2. An increase in unplanned settlements. China's rapid industrialisation has created an urgent need for more urban housing, which has resulted in a big increase in informal homes. Land prices have rocketed and made decent housing unaffordable, particularly near city centres. Two types of informal housing have emerged, both illegal under Chinese law. Expanded houses in villages on the edges of cities. Villagers add extra stories to the houses and then rent the extra space to migrant workers. And then farmland, owned collectively under communism, is privately developed for housing without permission. The third problem, pollution and health problems. Chinese economic growth has caused environmental problems that affect human health. China's air pollution, caused mostly by coal-fired power stations, is so bad that the capital, Beijing, has frequent pollution alerts. 70% of China's rivers and lakes are now polluted. The water in 207 of the Yangtze's tributaries are not even fit for irrigating farmland let alone drinking. A hundred cities suffer from extreme water shortages and 360 million Chinese do not have access to safe drinking water. Tap water in Chongqing contains 80 out of 101 forbidden toxins under Chinese law. In 2015, one US climate research organisation calculated that Chinese air pollution kills on average 4,400 people every day, or 1.6 million people each year. Their data showed that a third of the Chinese population breathes in air that would be considered unhealthy by US or European standards. Air pollution causes asthma, lung cancer and heart problems. 4. Land degradation. Despite having 22% of the world's population, China only has 6.4% of its land and 7.2% of its farmland. Rapid urbanisation and industrialisation are reducing this further, and over 40% of China's farmland is now suffering degradation. The rich black soils in the north are eroding, while in the south the soils are suffering from acidification caused by industrial emissions. Land clearance has also led to deforestation and over-intensive grazing. Number 5. Over-exploitation of resources and resource pressure. China has abundant oil and coal, as well as key metals such as iron ore, but its resources cannot keep up with its demand. So the Chinese government has sought additional resources in Africa and Latin America. Amazonian rainforest has been cleared in Ecuador, Cerro do Savannah has been converted to soy fields in Brazil, and oil fields are under development in Venezuela's Orinoco, Orinoco Belt, for all for China's consumption. I've lost fingers. 6. Loss of biodiversity. In 2015, the environmental charity WWF, in a report about China's demands on nature, found that China's terrestrial vertebrates had declined by 50% since 1970. The WWF researchers tracked over 2,400 populations of nearly 700 vertebrate species in China and discovered that almost half had vanished in the 45 years since 1970. The main cause of the habitat loss was the degradation of natural environments by economic development. The global shift, Leicester. Some regions in high income countries also face social and environmental problems as a result of the global shift. Leicester, with a population of 330,000 in 2011, is an East Midland city once dominated by the textile industry. It is, its story is typical of many long established industrial areas. By the 1920s, over 30,000 people worked in Leicester's textile mills. By the 1960s, one factory supplying knitwear for Marks and Spencers 
employed 6,500 workers on its own. The demand for extra factory workers brought Indian, Pakistani and later Ugandan Asians families to Leicester. These families set up home in the cheaper inner city wards of Spinney Hills and Belgrave. However, in the 1970s, overseas competition meant that cheaper clothes were available from Asia and many manufacturing jobs were lost in Leicester. Industries closed, causing deindustrialization. Leicester still has a small textile industry using local designers, but most items are now made in Asia. In 2016, Leicester's designers and specialist textile workers were helping to keep the textile industry alive, although with far fewer local employees. Liam Green's Hype Company and the internet business Boohoo and ASOS are examples, but British manufacturing continues to decline. By 2015, just 12% of m and clothing was made in the UK. The impact of global shift on UK industrial cities. Number one, dereliction and contamination. Many textile companies in Leicester were forced to close when businesses declined and a lot of previous industrial land was left abandoned or derelict. The industrial dereliction also scarred a number of other UK inner cities. For example, Sheffield suffered when its steelworks closed and most of Glasgow's shipyards fell into despair as work moved to the Far East. Much of the derelict industrial land was contaminated from the previous dumping of, chem of chemical waste or dyes or from manufacturing domestic glass gas from coal, such as the site of the London's O2 Arena, as well as from other industrial waste disposal. Number two, unemployment, depopulation and deprivation. Although the populations of most UK inner cities are now increasing, the 1970s and 1980s experienced major declines. For example, as traditional industries closed, the population of Newcastle on Tyne fell by 12% in the 1970s and another 6% in the 1990s. Many inner city areas became run down and, and the housing was low cost. As a result, many people on low incomes or unemployment benefits moved to these cheap areas, which became pockets of deprivation. In Leicester, areas of deprivation often coincide with the previous industrial areas, as well as with wards containing large ethnic populations, particularly British Indians. These are the very people who came to the UK to answer for the urgent need for extra factory workers in the boom years. Turning around some inner city areas has proved difficult. Many such areas have gained reputations for crime, mainly property related theft or burglary, or linked to antisocial behaviour. In fact, crime rates have fallen sharply since 2000, particularly violence, burglary, robbery and car theft. Some reasons are technological, such as car immobilisers, but the decline in crime may be due to regeneration, employment opportunities and gentrification. And that is the end of episode number six. I hope you learned something. That was all the global shift, the winners and losers. Next week, we're gonna be looking at global interactions and all that that has to entail. So please do subscribe down below. I upload these videos every Monday, 4.30 p.m. And yeah, I hope you've had a lovely day. I hope this was useful. Yeah, see you soon. Bye.